Greg. Yes. How are you? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you. Yes. So before we delve into the album, I'd like to jump back a little bit. And I read somewhere that you recorded soundtracks when you were younger. Yeah, most likely. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what they were now. <laughs> but, but do you yeah. remember what, what kind of struck you in, in, in film scores? And, and um, I think like a, a good film score just is so like imaginative, like mm. thought provoking. Like you think of, um, you know, like I think the Truman Show was like one that really struck me when I first heard it. Like Philip Glass's kind of minimalist sure. score for some of that, and it just sounded like so visual. And obviously, it's tied to you know, to film itself, which is I think kind of what gives it that. But it was a lot of that. It was just sort of the, the sounds that they would do in soundtracks you wouldn't really hear in, on pop records as much. Like something like Ennio Morricone would be doing. Mm -hmm. Like his horror soundtracks, or um, you know, you'd have um, you know, two thousand one or something like a, what is it a Ligeti like that whole like sequence at the end with like the, the space like travel. Mm -hmm. So I just thought it was like so imaginative. I think that I was struck by that, like the like I said, like the type of sounds you wouldn't hear in, in a pop record. And and was that early on, or was that something you you kind of developed over time? That, that first you maybe listen to pop music and then delved into? Yeah, I think it was over time. Okay. I think it, it's as I got more into films, like those scores started really presenting themselves and I started being like, wow, this is the score is actually amazing. And I would start thinking mm -hmm. about things like that way and just being like in love with like a film score all of a sudden. Um, and then that just happens like over and over now, you know, where I just think of like, wow, this, this score is amazing and, and I listen to a lot of film music mm -hmm. just for that same reason. It just, it gives you a different flavor. And then does it also add an aspect, maybe maybe this, this comes later than when you start composing your own music itself, but, but in terms of storytelling, the way music evokes mm -hmm. certain emotions, and did that affect how you started writing? Yeah, I think I've been writing since way before I was like aware that I love film music, okay. but yeah, I think it, when that happened, it definitely intersected my songwriting, and I started to at least not really that. I wasn't really using the, like the setting, like like that. Mm -hmm. I was more using kind of like the sounds okay. that I liked in film scores. But I think what you said is interesting because as time goes on, I think I have kind of adapted. Um, I like like a, a song to kind of feel like a scene, mm -hmm. like in a film, you know. And I, I love I love just like a setting. Like I, I think in a lot of the songs that uh, the group is doing, there's like just this kind of like setting going on that you like just know right away. It's not like right. abstract. It's like, you know. Um, sitting down in a restaurant or on the Lower East Side or um, living room, you know, it's like all these settings are kind of present and I think that's a very, it's a, definitely a big film influence, you know. Well, before we go further into this, yeah. uh, I find it interesting, so you were writing uh, quite early on then. Mm -hmm. What did you get out of it, especially at, at, at such a young age? I think that was just totally like instinctual. Okay. It, was, it was like compulsive, like I just had to write. So it was kind of like fun, and it was, then you would say, you would like marvel at your own, which you could kind of make, like you were, you know, it's kind of like you were just drawing and, mm. and doing things like that. So I think that was the initial thing. And as time went on, then it became more cathartic, like, oh, I can actually deal with emotions um, through writing. Mm -hmm. Before, I think it was just kind of a, you're just kind of trying things out, like you're just marveling at the sound of things and like what kind of what kind of sounds you can have. It's just more like a sound level. Mm -hmm. And then the content, like the emotions and those things, those came much later. When you started, was it, was it immediately to share? Yeah, it was actually. I remember like the first song I wrote, I remember I would, like played like a, played it for like my whole family, okay. like in a living, <laughs> or like in a living room and I was like, here's the first song I've ever written and just kind of like played it for everybody. So I, I like started with an audience right away. But, but so, yeah. the, and especially that first song, and then you can see <laughs> the reaction in people's eyes. So, yeah, so yeah. what does that do to you? And then you mentioned that creative aspect, especially when you, when you first started mm -hmm. out, so. Um, yeah, it was thrilling. I still remember, I actually vividly remember that performance that okay. I gave from my family. I remember because I like messed up at some point too, and I said like, oops, and I got like a huge laugh from the room. Mm -hmm. It's just like that, it's like this, um, becoming like an entertainer, just knowing that you can um, provoke an audience that way, or mm -hmm. like kind of, uh, you know, delight and things like that. That was, uh, I got hooked on that really quick. And so, when, when did it develop from something that you did by yourself and then kind of to, to something you, you thought, mm -hmm. well, maybe, maybe I can, I yeah. can tour the world with this or? I know, that's crazy. And I think I'd always thought about that because I was, I mean, I used to watch, you know, 
a year and a half in the life of Metallica, and they're right. like, going on tour all the time. And I was like, that, that's, that's amazing, I want to do that. I want to be in a studio, I want to be, like, be on tour. So it was always in my mind that I wanted that. Um, I just didn't know how to get from point A to point B. And I just thought, well, I can just play music and kind of try it out. But uh, I was always playing with other players in bands. I think that's how I got better. But the writing-wise, it was always just kind of me, solo, for whatever mm. reason. And uh, recording-wise, I was, I was just like, I had like an 8-track and I would just record stuff myself. It was pretty rare that I got other people to record with me. I think because I was just being kind of a perfectionist at that point, or like a, I should say a control freak at that point. Right. Which I still am now. <laughs> but, well, yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah, I can imagine that isn't easy to let go. Yeah, it was never easy to let go. I had to make some sort of breakthrough where I um, got sick of myself doing that mm. and then said, all right, we're just going to get other players and the aesthetic is going to be that you have like the spontaneous approach mm -hmm. and that you kind of do it that way. I had to kind of make a new, a new way for myself to kind of get to from that old era where just me playing everything to the next step, which is much more fulfilling now. And, and do you notice uh, the difference between how you, how you approach your music then in, in those two settings? Um, yeah, I think the approach then was, yeah, I can kind of like kind of think of it in different terms. Like then I was recording and I would just do songs kind of spontaneously as well, but I would be recording them in like a night hmm. and I would come out with a finished song the next day or something, which is a lot of the older stuff was like that. And now it's, I uh, will write a song and like do like, spend a lot of time on the lyrics and things like that, and then we'll just bring it into the band and we'll play a few takes and it'll be done. So it's kind of slight. It's, it was always spontaneous, and, and I love sponta spontaneity in music. I was never one to like want to spend like a lot, a lot of time doing like one song. Right. I just kind of would lose interest or I would feel like it would get worse as I would work on it more or something. Mm -hmm. So I love when it's just done very quickly, like a, like a jazz record, you know? That's interesting. <laughs> so how, how do you look back at certain... Well, if, if we take one, you know, the, the EP, mm -hmm. how do you look back at it? Because, uh, as you say, it was quite spontaneous. So can, how do you look back at it? I, I love it. I think it's great. Um, and I think it has to do with that, too, that there was a lot of different players on it. And um, I can think of like how the night was and, and things like that. It's a lot of fun memories. But I just think it's, it, there's such a... It has that spark to it that I wanted that you get in a record like Kind of Blue or something where you, they just did it very quickly, or the mm -hmm. Cowboy Junkies Trinity Session. So I think there's something really special to it, and I, and I, I, I got hooked on that, okay. and I wanted to just do that from now on. So that's how we record every record is very quickly, like, in, and it's all like location recording, we don't mm -hmm. go in the studio or anything. Like that was done in the stairway, and the other stuff was done in rehearsal space. Right. And uh, we have, you know, one of the songs on the record is also done in a stairway in New York. So, yeah, I just love that. I think it's so. Uh, it uh, it gives that music its strength a lot. Mm -hmm. The their approach to it. And similarly with the, with the, with the earlier songs, when you listen to them back now, are you instantly reconnected to kind of the emotion that that, that originated in that song, or are are you connected to the recording and, and like say the oh, farewell? Or? Yeah, I think it kind of all comes floating back, which okay. is great. Um, and I don't. The thing is, I don't really listen to it too much. Okay. It's funny because now, like, I'll I'll hear it like if I'm in a in a bar or something in a restaurant, mm -hmm. and that's like kind of the time I get to hear it. Cause I would, yeah, I usually wouldn't just put it on myself. Sure. I guess because we're playing it every <laughs> night. <laughs> and you're like kind of like well, I've heard it a lot. Right. Um, but every time I do hear it, it um, it's a, a good experience. So I, I really enjoy it, and I'm really like uh, grateful for those times. You know? And what I, what I read about. Uh, you as well as is, is uh, it was described as a recent upswell in millions of YouTube hits. But but yeah. so so what what role, <laughs> in a sense, does does social media in, the, in these these days as a musician kind mm. of play in in getting your music out there? And For us, it was pretty much everything. Almost mm. it's strange that we really seem to have benefited from that. Like it felt like the song went viral on YouTube, and then. Mm -hmm. Everything happening now is just that spark. It was kind of crazy how it worked. So I think it's just, it's, you know, as important as possible. It's like, you know, a record store or something in the right. old days, or it's like radio. So I can say with total confidence that, that it, you know, it, it did a lot for us. And I think that probably most artists could benefit from it, you know. Sure. If, and, and they will. I'm pretty sure they will. Just because people are interested in it. It's like people are using it all the time and... That's how they. That's how people talk about fillings and how, how people sure. share things now. So it makes total sense. P people share music, and it's a necessity almost. You know. 